If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right, welcome back. It's great to have you with me here today. Um, I'm jumping on a, a call and a chat with Matt McLennan, and he is an industrial real estate broker out of the Seattle market uh, up in Washington. And uh, it's a great conversation to chat with him today because we dig into the brokerage side of the business. He has some great advice on things that you can do, uh, whether you're in uh, uh, commercial or residential on on how you can uh, really grow your actual brokerage side of the business. So um, some great tips there. And then he has started investing in his his asset class. He knows industrial, so he is buying industrial. He's invested in syndication. Um, and so we talk about that and he actually dives in and gives us some of the numbers that he's seeing, because again, it's really important for me uh, to explain and, and to share with all of you what these different asset classes actually look like in the return profiles that these things are um, are presenting because then you can make informed decisions on what makes the most sense for you to start investing in um, so it's a great conversation uh, matt's a great guy it's it's really good chatting with him and catching up as always if you're getting something out of the show please go on rate and review it helps us out a ton to bring on awesome guests like we have today um we have another uh, announcement. We are launching a fund. And so we are uh, putting that out there right now. You are listening to this and you've been learning about funds and syndications and learning about investing in general. Um, and so now we're at a point where I want to start talking about one very specifically that I've set up and geared towards you so that you can start investing um, and getting uh, some of that active income and converting it into some passive income. So uh, stay tuned. I, I want to have those conversations. We're going to be putting on some webinars and putting on a few other educational things so that uh, we can address that fund specifically. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, reach out to to me, podcast at agentsbuildingcashflow.com. Um, you can reach me there and uh, without further ado, let's talk to Matt and let's have this conversation. Let's go. We're proud to be sponsored by Ridgeline Investment Group. Ridgeline has a track record of transacting more than 53 million in assets throughout Texas. Ridgeline is currently looking to acquire 100 to 200 unit class B multifamily communities between five and 20 million in San Antonio, Temple, Waco, Tyler, and other Texas secondary markets. To learn more about Ridgeline Investment Group, visit www.ridgelineig.com. All right, Matt, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on today. Thanks for joining me. Um, I was going through and taking a look at some of your history. You've got the big hitter award for the last three years with your brokerage. Um, well, I wanted to just start there and see what that is and if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, thank you for having me, Randall. I'm really excited to be here and chat with you. Uh, I work for a firm called Kidder Matthews. We're, we're a local commercial brokerage. Our, uh, our, our big hitter award is a, you know, self-made uh, production award. It just, it recognizes our top producers within our company. And it's just a measure of, you know, gross commission income and numbers of transactions and things like that. So yeah, to your, to your point, um, I've had a great couple of past years and been fortunate enough to, to make that list and, and be part of that group within our company. So it's been great. Uh, learned a lot along the way, had a lot of help along the way as well. So nice. sitting here in a, in a good spot, enjoying it. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so I just saw that, and I was like, "We're we gotta we gotta start there." Um, all right, so tell us, you know, for those of those who are listening, don't don't know who you are, uh, what market you're in, and and what asset class you focus on, and 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 uh, yeah, start there. Let's go with that. Yeah. So I, I work this Seattle market. I, I actually work out in Tacoma, which for those who don't know, is kind of the sister city of Seattle. We're about 35 miles south from Seattle along the I five corridor. And, but when you're looking at our market, I mean, it's, it's kind of Western Washington is the greater category. And then within that, I work the industrial market. So I only do commercial properties. And then within commercial properties, all I focus on are industrial properties, which 
to take that just one step further, there's there's really kind of three big categories. It's it's distribution buildings, manufacturing buildings, and outside storage or industrial outside storage, IOS. That's kind of a, a key phrase that's being used pretty often. And then really from within there, leasing, sales, land development, investment, anything under that industrial umbrella is my niche. I don't really stray from that, but I'll, I'll help any of my clients with any kind of industrial property that they need. Have you seen, we were talking a minute ago about the iOS stuff and how you were in on that early before it really became, uh, mm -hmm. so you were well positioned to take advantage of that uptick. Um, so have you, uh, ha do you focus mainly on one of those? Is it the warehouse, the iOS, or is it, is it really just across the board? That's your niche, you're in uh, industrial. It's across the board. Our market, Seattle is really unique. I shouldn't say really unique, but unique in a way that we have two major ports here. It's the port of Seattle and the port of Tacoma. And that is really the driver of our entire industrial market. Consequently, you think about a port, it's bringing containers from overseas and distributing them amongst the general public, the distribution centers, the warehouses, right? So our market is probably, if you use the 80-20 rule, 80% distributors. Consequently, we're about 80% distribution focused buildings. So I probably spend the most majority of my time on those distribution type, you know, think ton of dock doors on the front and Amazon fulfillment center, right? I do a lot of that, but a lot of the support behind those distribution centers is like that iOS sector you mentioned, those semi trucks, those containers, uh, any of those goods that don't need to go in a warehouse need to go somewhere. And it's usually a lot cheaper to put them on a piece of dirt rather than put them under the roof of a warehouse. So iOS is a support to the primary kind of operation going on here in our market. And to your point, it was always a sector of the market that I was interested in. Really, that's kind of how I got into it. And then I started tracking it. And then I saw the upside in doing work in there. And then it all just kind of snowballed from there. So I'm a little bit all over the board. But uh, but naturally, just given how heavy our distribution market is, I, I do spend a lot of time there. Okay, right on. So I'm curious, just because I've talked to some other industrial guys, and obviously COVID and people staying at home, ordering a ton of uh, of Amazon packages, right? Anything online uh, caused a massive spike in the need for distribution centers, the need for um, you know those those iOS sites. So since that has now passed, I guess that ha, ha, are you seeing that that um, learned behavior is is still creating the demand for that, or has it kind of leveled out? Um, or you tell me. I mean, I'm just kind of curious on on the competition for those sites or the the, the demand for them, the pricing for them? I would say, generally speaking, demand is still really high. Pricing is still... Really, uh, every Pick every metric is probably still pretty high. Okay. And now it's really been ebbing and flowing as the general economy and the market is changing. I mean, you, you nailed COVID. If you look at any e-commerce, right? That's the driver of all this. And so pre-COVID, e-commerce was already climbing. I mean, if you're like me, I come home and it seems like every day I have an Amazon package at my doorstep. I mean, it really... And so... It was already on trend and then COVID happened and everything really accelerated. We had, I laugh because we had three months solid, May, June, or I'm sorry, March, April, May, where our market shut down. Within 90 days, we were ramped back up and it was, it was, I mean, it felt like we were on rocket fuel for everything else. And so the demand was through the roof. Pricing was going up at a crazy rate. It was nuts. Look back to, or now fast forward to today. I mean, Things are still, it's a tight market. We're 5% vacant, which, you know, means that literally 95% of our buildings are, are full. Um, e com if you read any, you know, periodical about what e-commerce is doing, I mean, it's still growing at a pretty rapid clip and growing faster than anybody would have predicted, call it five years ago, right? So that's really supporting our market. It's keeping things healthy. It's fueled. It's just depending on the day and what's going on. I mean, this whole interest rate thing, right? I mean, it's just, everything's just kind of, it's all over the board, but generally speaking, still very uh, competitive. Yeah, that's that's what I was wondering if uh, because of COVID, people are still they, they got very used to it. Like there was a large portion mm -hmm. of people who were buying all of their things like we started getting our groceries delivered, all of the that that sort of behavior that you're doing everything online prior to COVID. Um, but I think it forced a lot of people to do it. So um sounds like it, they adopted it and they're kind of sticking with it. And that's going to keep the, the demand high for that for that um, business. So. Okay. So as you and I were talking a second ago, um, I always like to go in and talk brokerage and, and figure out, you know, what you're doing. We've got a lot of, um, agents and, and, uh, real estate professionals that listen and, and 
um, I always like having some kind of like, what are you working on now? Or what are you doing that is helping you uh, either win some business or really stand out in your market uh, when things have gotten a little bit more competitive? I think for me, it starts with the client, right? And providing high quality service. We're a pretty competitive market like most. And we're pretty saturated brokerage market as well. We have a lot of quality, uh, competent firms. And because of that, there is a lot of people competing for these clients' business, right? They have a lot of options. And so the way I try to stand out is just providing above standard service. That's a big one. Um, really getting your name out there. If there's one thing I feel as a commercial broker that we as a as an industry are incredibly poor at compared to our residential friends, they are awesome at self-promotion, whether it's their company, their, their personal brand, whatever it is. Commercial brokers don't do it and they're really bad and they're lazy and they're terrible at it. And so I've made a huge pivot in my business. And I'll, I'll tell you candidly, I'm not really a social media guy by trade, but I've made a huge push to get into that. And, and part of that is, is similar to what you do on your show, which is really educating my audience and educating my clients and, and taking an altruistic approach, which I think resonates within the market, within my clients. But then really, what does it come down to today? It's the hustle. I mean, we're, we're working in a market environment and an economy right now where everything is harder than it used to be, if you, if you ask me. And so showing your clients how hard you're working for them, adding value, and really taking the the step above just average to, to give them what they need that that resonates yeah all right i'm gonna say a couple things about this one about the commercial versus residential on the social media front and then the way you wrap that up it tells me why on the commercial side you should be doing more social right so first i want to address it i agree i think the residential side you've got guys running around with their phone. They're like, Hey, look at me. I just listed to this house, da, 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 you know, like stuff like that. And so I feel, this is just my personal opinion, um, that that is kind of, it, it, it almost like cheapens it. And, and it, it's almost like the, like, I don't know, I compare it to like, it's a terrible analogy, but like used car salesman, sort of something right. Where you're just, it's not as, um, as professional, I guess that that's been my mentality. But then you get to the point to how you finish that comment was, um, it's important that your clients see what you're doing and what you're working on and how you're providing value to them. And so, you know, that if you can, if you can frame your social media in that, in that format where either you're doing a promotion and saying, Hey, these guys just close a great deal. They are fantastic, phenomenal, whatever it is. Obviously everybody does their own thing. This is just me, my like personal opinion on it. I think that's why a lot of commercial guys stay away from it though, just because it seems, I don't want to say beneath them, but it just seems like it's, it's like, not as uh, professional. Maybe that's the best way to put it. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I do. It's, it's, you're, I completely agree with you. I, I laugh if you go on, you know, any social media channel these days. I call them like designer investors. I mean, how many people do you see these days that are the social influencers who that are telling you about how awesome their passive income portfolio is? And you can be a real estate guy tomorrow and you don't have to put any money down. And by the way, look at this, this sweet property I just invest. I mean, it's just, you can, you can see right through it, right? And not to say that some of them aren't actually doing it, right? I mean, to a certain degree, there is, there is some realism there, but it cheapens it. Completely agree. Yeah. And so that's where I told myself that if I was actually going to do this, like when I told my wife that this was going to be an approach I actually took, she, she laughed at me. And I said, I'm not going to be the guy who's, who's doing that kind of content. My content is going to be focused on trying to really add value and highlight what's going on in the market and education focus, kind of like I said yeah. before. Um, cause I think that is the way, cause really on the commercial side, we're dealing with businesses. We're not dealing with, we are dealing with people within the businesses, the business owners, but it's making real estate decisions that are focused on taking care of a business rather than helping somebody buy a home, which a home is usually an emotional purchase. There's a little more of a personal aspect to it. So me standing out in front of a building with my phone pointed at me to, you know, do that kind of stuff. It just doesn't. To your point, I don't think it resonates as, as much. And, yeah. and either way, because the commercial industry is the way it is, it's just no one's really doing it because it's it's just has never really been a thing. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to, to a certain degree, so, buck that trend a little bit, but keep it within the lines, I yeah. guess. What are you, so what are you doing? How do you, how do you add value to, um, like, what are, what's an example of something you've done that's not just necessarily like, hey, the market shifted by, you know, you know two points and da-da-da-da, this is what's happening. Uh, is there something that you... This is really just, I'm, I'm very curious myself, mm -hmm. uh, like how you've thought about this and thought this through, because I think this would help other people work it out in their heads as well. 
I think a big one that I've done, if you go look at some of my content that I've, I've put out in the past, a lot of it is centered around. So if you look at the commercial market, we do, uh, it's, you know, if you boil it down to its most simple fact, it's buying and selling, but also leasing. Leasing is a huge part of the commercial market. If you've ever read a lease contract, it'll put you to sleep in about two minutes. And, and, but it's, it's really important, right? I mean, you're putting, especially when it's a business lease and if it's a sizable transaction and these companies are committing to millions of dollars in investment, it's a really important document. Guess what? The number of even, you could probably pick very sophisticated companies who don't understand the lease, don't read it and won't commit themselves to doing it. So I've, I've taken the approach of, uh, like, for example, take picking apart a lease document, calling out critical clauses and trying to simplify it in a way for my audience where I'll, I'll go through something critical and spend one minute on a video or two minutes, whatever it is, and just go through that to help somebody understand that. And, and am I doing that for the Fortune 500 company? No, probably not because they're pretty sophisticated and they have internal, you know, counsel and everything else Legal, that helps yeah. them out with that. But like my mom and pop clients who are at a point where they have multiple locations, they've been in business a long time, but they still just don't necessarily understand certain clauses of that lease, or maybe it's a purchase agreement, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Is that, that'd be one example of yeah. something I do beyond just talking about the market. That's smart. Yeah. I like that. It's a really good tip. Um, yeah, because then you have, uh, not just a lot of content because you can go through at least, I imagine these things are, are, uh, pretty dense, right? Lots of clauses that you mm -hmm. can go through and pick apart. So that gives you a lot of content. Plus, um, you can make it real short and punchy and sweet. So yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, yeah, take that. So uh, you, you brought the, brought up the two different types of clients as well. So who, do you have any particular that you focus on mostly? Is it mom and pop? Is that like your bread and butter or is it really more institutional? Probably our view by 70, 30 mom and pop to institutional. Yeah. I mean, working with the institutions is, is great. They're, they're sophisticated. They have great teams. They have buckets of money. I mean, I'll check all the boxes of a lot of ideal things they have. I mean, they're, they're great to work with. Uh, but really, mom and pop small business is still a huge part of our at least local economy here and our industrial market specifically. And so I do a lot of work with those guys. Um, frankly, I, I'm kind of the nature of me as a person. I, I enjoy helping. There's a reason I'm, I'm putting out the educational type content. I mean, working with a mom and pop, frankly, is a little more rewarding because it's you see their, their personal business and the blood, sweat and tears they put into it. And then being able to help them through a complicated real estate decision. Uh, don't get me wrong. I love working with my institutional clients, but they're just, it's just different. So yeah. I don't really focus necessarily on one or the other. I'm, I'm servicing both of them as often and as much as I can, but probably have your own mom and pop side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's an interesting take too, that you get, uh, you get to see their business grow and work with them on, on, uh, on an ongoing basis as well. Um, so, all right, we were talking a, a minute ago as well about, investing. Um, you're in the industrial asset class uh, and you said you have some investments. So let's dive in, talk a little bit about that, uh, what you've invested in. Um, and, and, and Lynn, we'll go from there just because I'm curious. We didn't get into that. Yeah. I think for me, I decided early on when I was going to start going down the road of investing, I, I made a decision that I want to focus on investing in what I know. Right. I'm, I'm a, just personally, I'm a big believer in it, it probably comes from what I do for work every day. Hire the experts to help you with the things that you're not an expert in. And so when it came to investing, I thought I know industrial real estate. I know industrial properties. That's what I, on the real estate investing side, that's what I'm going to put my money into. I have a financial advisor who helps me with stocks and mutual funds and everything else. I'm diversified in that regard. But when it comes to real estate investing, I focus on industrial properties. And so what's that has turned into combing the market for old stale listings, unseen opportunities, off market deals, whatever it is, right? And I've been fortunate enough to come across a few sites, actually interesting in the lead enough, mostly in that iOS sector, that industrial outside storage product type that I keep referring to, which for those who aren't generally familiar with it, we call it you know, a low coverage site or a covered land play. It's essentially a small building on a much larger land site that facilitates some kind of an industrial business that benefits from the building. They have a little office there or a little, you know, warehouse shop or something to store some tools and miscellaneous product or vehicles in. But then the balance of the site is really used for parking fleet vehicles, semi trucks, laying down materials, piping, chain link fencing. I mean, pick, pick your type of company and that's the niche, right? And so 
I have invested in a couple of those properties. I've actually also participated in a syndication as an LP with it's an iOS specific fund. And so I just put my money into that to a much larger group who's buying these properties on a national basis. So funny enough, my, my investing has actually really been heavy in that iOS sector, but I'm really looking at anything industrial, existing single tenant, you know, tilt up concrete buildings, manufacturing operations. I mean, whatever kind of fits my mold and my niche, that's, that's what I'm hunting for. Awesome. All right. A lot in there that I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about the, the, since you did a syndication, kind of like the return profile on that and what you're seeing in that market in, in a minute. So what was the first thing you bought? First thing I ever bought was it was a former residential house that got up zoned to a commercial industrial zoning. It sat on, um, it was sat on about 2.3 acres. And I mean, it was a house through and through, and it was like a 60s arrows house. It was not pretty. Uh, but granted, I live in the industrial world, so things don't really have to be pretty. It's kind of the nature of it. So we we got in, we spent some money on the property, the house, kind of cleaned up the whole place, laid new gravel down. I mean, did a ton of work. Not a huge investment because none of what we did was really that expensive, but just really got the property up to snuff. And then, you know, through my brokerage business, put it on the market for lease and went and hunted for a tenant. And and I'll be the first to admit. My very first investment, it was, it did not really go as I planned. It's actually doing incredibly well right now, but hell, it took us a year to get the property stabilized, which the broker in me like had a, a, a small tier going for that going, how can I not get my own property leased faster than a year? But just given market conditions and our underwriting expectations and, and the type of tenant we were looking for, it took longer than we thought. So, I mean, you've probably heard this from other people on your show. Uh, Sometimes making mistakes in your early investments is the best way to learn. And I learned sure. a ton from that one. And so I'm, I'm actually really glad it went the way it did, but it's not always easy. I mean, even if it's your expertise, it's, it's not easy. Oh, for sure. For sure. And that's why you invest in syndications with operators who have done tons and tons of them. Um, so, all right, tell me tell, a couple of things on this. So you bought the house. Did you level the house? Kept the house. Kept the house. Okay. So you have a structure there. You, it's still yes. a similar uh, covered land place. So. Um, I'm always curious on these deals where you're finding that tenant anyway, it's listed, it's out there. Mm -hmm. So was it a single tenant or is it like, Hey, I need 15 truckers to park their trucks on this property. Or like, well, what does that even look like? Single tenant. There is demand. Like the example you just mentioned, which is kind of like a paper spot truck lot. We have plenty of those operators in our market. I personally, with it being my property, the idea of I would probably, uh, well, first of all, I couldn't manage that. It's, it's way too management intensive, but we have operators out there who I would give them the master lease and then they would go manage that themselves. And am I strictly opposed to that? Probably not, but is it ideal? Probably not. Cause I just think there's, you know, on any given day, a ton of, of business operators coming on my property that I just don't know. Right. right. And to me, that wasn't worth it. But so you asked where, where do I find these tenants? I mean, obviously being on the open market is the easiest way to, probably have other brokers bring clients, but I also have just via my travels, proprietary database, tenants in the market that I'm tracking and talking to all the time. So it's just proactively reaching out to companies, letting know about the availability, the offering, what we can do. I mean, with it being my own personal property, it made it a hell of a lot easier to to put everything out there and kind of dictate the terms and, yeah. and be flexible. Right. So yeah. Awesome. Just okay. hustling. Yeah. Um, okay. So it took a year and a half to stabilize, meaning you, a year and a half to find that single tenant because it was a single tenant deal. Yeah. I think from the time we closed on the property to the time the lease was signed and occupancy had commenced, I think it was exactly 12 months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so putting the gravel, the, the thing I love about this is that it is relatively low um, maintenance, right? I mean, it seems mm -hmm. as though... Uh, so you're, you're fixing up, you're not doing any TIs, I imagine, or do you have to do tenant improvements? We, we didn't do any TIs for our tenant. I mean, we, we mentioned that we did some stuff proactively up front yeah. to kind of get the property up to, call, I would call it minimum snuff. Yeah. We negotiated with the tenant. They wanted to do some work on the property that felt a little more proprietary to their use. We said, great, you know, get after it. I think we gave them, I can't remember if we gave them a small allowance or oftentimes what we'll do in our market is like a month of free rent just for their moving costs and whatever yeah. else they want to do. So we did that up front, And then really, so I signed that lease with them back in November. We're sitting here in August. I haven't heard a peep out of them. I, I do have third-party property management that does manage the property for me. So they at least do the accounting, the books mm -hmm. and all that, which is, is well worth it. And it's triple net lease. So the 10 days for it, it's fantastic. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but it's really been, 
the getting it stabilized was the upfront work. Now it's it's kind of set it and forget it, which is really nice. Okay. So this is your deal. Can, can we can we talk numbers on it? Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I just love, I, I'm deal junkie still. Like I like to know what's happening. So you bought this thing, it's two acres, had a house on it. So I paid, we paid nine fifty for the property. Okay. And I think we figured out that we put about probably about 150 into it. So I'm into it for about 1.1 okay. and then we leased it on a three year lease and the tenant is paying 11, five triple net on that. So we're, we're in the double digit return you know, status yeah. at that point. And they're, they've got annual bumps in their lease. They, like I mentioned, they've already invested money into improving the, bu- the building and the space. I mean, I don't, I don't really perceive them leaving and chances are, and, and we knew this going in, it was kind of by design of why we did a short term lease is rents have been continuing to increase. So when that three year lease is up, I have no doubt that we'll probably either renew them at a higher amount or we'll probably be able to go find another tenant at a, at a even higher amount, probably than what the break that we would give them for being an existing tenant. But but my investment threshold day one was to try to get double digit cap rate, double digit return. And, you know, we figured that out pretty easily. Yeah. That's awesome. That, so that's, that's kind of in line with what I want to talk about as far as the return profiles for these deals. Um, because obviously over the last few years, uh, cap rates compressed on multifamily mm-hmm. big time. And that's really what I focus on. Um, there's a bit of, of, uh, cap rate growth right now happening, which is nice to see mm-hmm. just because yep. transactions can't happen be without, without debt. Um, and so what, what's happening on industrial? Have you guys seen, uh, uh price declines or still, uh, price discovery is still demand so high that it doesn't matter. People are getting the prices. Like, what are you seeing in that, on that side? It's literally all over the board. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would argue it's still a lot of price discovery seller expectations versus buyer realities there's there's still pretty sizable delta there most of the time and that we our market just like every other one for the most part got so inflated through post covid through the first interest rate hike and so people were just getting astronomical prices for the property and then as soon as they started rising interest rates as quickly as all those prices went up they started coming back down because Anyone who knows how to calculate, you know, a financial performer can figure out why you can't pay as much as you could the day before, right? But sellers don't want to hear that. And by the way, they're not looking at their own performer to figure that out themselves. So it's it's been my job as the broker to be the bearer of bad news of, hey, I hate to tell you, but your land's worth half of what it was worth 12 months ago, right? Um, but what's, what's the devil in the details is the land was never really worth that much to begin with, right? Because it, it was just so inflated because we were on that post pandemic rocket fuel money cost virtually nothing. It was very readily available and easy to go get. So anyway, that's, that's my long way of saying that we, we were living in this dream world. The dream world's over. Things are still really healthy. There's a ton of money sitting on the sidelines. I mean, you, you know that well with what you do every day. I mean, a lot of people want to invest all those funds that were out there and even personal people who want to be part of syndications or, you know, have still our high net worth or high income individuals who want to put money into real estate, they're there. And then it's just, but it's matching up return expectations with the realities of, of what sellers are willing to sell for cap rates. I mean, they've definitely gone up, but there's been so few data points to really support what is our true market cap rate. I mean, that my institutional clients, I'm going to probably get that question daily, if not weekly. Hey, Matt, where do you think cap rates are right now? And if they ask me or nine of my competitors, I'm inclined to think we could probably give them 10 different answers, probably pretty close to each other, but different. So it's just, it's figuring out deal by deal and, and really at the end of the day, calculating the numbers and figuring out what makes sense. Yeah. And, it, and a point there, if you're looking at deals is it has to make sense to you, right? Like it, even though cap rate, you may say it's, you know, six and a half and somebody else is seven it, the deal makes sense to you and you're buying it then still execute. Right. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. So, all right. talking about uh, syndication. You invested in a syndication. So again, on the multifamily side, I, I get, I, I see these um, uh, offerings coming out quite a bit and, and mm-hmm. syndications and funds and that sort of thing. And what people are putting out there, you don't have to say who it is or anything like that if you don't want to, but I'm just kind of curious, like how, uh, wh- what, what, Maybe maybe start with when you started that investment, uh, and what was being promoted at the time, and are you still seeing that type of return profile presented in any new offerings that you're getting in the industrial space? If that yeah. does that make sense? 
Yeah, great. Um, I've got to think back to the time I put money into the syndication. It was probably, if I had to go back, it was probably early 21. So I'm, I'm probably about two and a half years into that. And it was, it, like I, I think I mentioned, it's an iOS specific fund. It was through a local wealth management firm here in Seattle. They kind of started off as a family office and then expanded well beyond that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're a great household name. And so I, I went in trust. And it was actually at the time, interestingly enough, my financial advisor worked there. So he was the one that, that brought me into the fold on that one. Read through the return profile, the IRR, the you know the expected cash dividends. I mean, everything else about it. It, it inherently checked the boxes. I was really hesitant to put the money into it because the the minimum buy in was was relatively substantial, and uh, I, I I inherently want to invest in my own deals because I think through brokerage I have better visibility into that. But I was sitting on some cash and I wasn't finding any of my own deals at the time that made sense. And I thought, hey, this will be a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about syndications because I've never been a part of one. And meanwhile, their thesis, I think that's the biggest one if you're looking at a syndication is do you believe in what the syndication is going after, right? And they were going after that iOS sector, which was one that I was on the forefront from and I believed in it heavily. So I right off the bat, I was like, what you guys are doing is what I'm doing every day. You're just doing it at a national level with much more money than I have in my pocket. So if I can contribute some of my income towards that, I'm pretty optimistic and confident that the fund's going to perform. Case of point, here we are two and a half years later, and it's outperforming all the expectations that were originally outlined. They've already started raising a second fund to do the exact same thing. So yeah, you know, and, and you don't always get lucky like that, but seemingly my instincts were correct and really glad I did it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, that, that is so many things that you just said. Okay. So a lot of people that are in real estate that do want to invest end up wanting to invest only in their deals. Um, and you mentioned that just now. So how did you, I, you, I mean, you kind of answered it, but how did you overcome that? I, I'm just going to go and, and plug it in. Um, was it, yeah, you just answered that. You, you, you cut that question out, honestly, just because you, you answered it so well, but there's something in there that I want to, I want to pull on just because, um, I, I guess when you are looking at someone else doing the deal, do you feel as though it's worthwhile investing in the syndication so that you have your time and your, your freedom, I guess, to sit there, you get to, uh, collect the checks, you, you get someone else working and your dollars are really working for you. I guess that's kind of the the idea behind the syndication question. Um, it's not really a question though. So I, I think I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So it, it, it took a little internal battle to get over that. I mean, I even, it, a natural thing for me, I mean, one of the beauties of my company and, and some of the people I'm surrounded with is we, we share our investment ideas with each other all the time. And I brought it to several other people because I, I also had the opportunity to do that. I mean, it was an open funding opportunity. And I didn't get really anyone to fight off of it with me, but I asked for feedback and opinions. And a lot of people said, Hey, the numbers are great. It's just, you know, it's not my time. I don't have that kind of cash right now. I don't know if I believe in the people, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And so you hit the nail on the head. I looked at it and thought, yes, this isn't my own deal, which inherently was a little bit of an internal struggle, but I'm not spending any time on this. I mean, I literally write a check and that is it. And, and that was a big thing that got me over the hump, but really more than anything, it's, it was, I knew it would be a big learning experience. Cause if I was going to put my own money into it, yeah, I mean, you better believe I was going to pay attention to it and know what was yeah. going on. And I mean, I think that's a huge one. I know a lot of your audience is trying to figure out how to make their first investment and, and get over the hump of not just stashing away your brokerage income, but learn how to turn it into passive income. And the biggest advice I give to everybody who's looking for that, get started early. Right. Don't be afraid to to take the leap of faith and, and potentially even fail. Right. I mean, if you're you're working in brokerage or, or whatever job you're in, that if you feel confident in your ability to create income and you go make a mistake, well, guess what? You made a mistake, you lost money, and and then get back up on your feet and try to figure out again. But don't ever be afraid to take the leap. If you look at a syndication specifically, like the one we're talking about, I mean, you're you're theoretically on a on a limited basis partnering with people who really know what they're doing. So you can count on learning along the way if it's something you don't know how to do, if you don't know how to source your own deal or don't know how to syndicate your own deal as, you know, a GP or whatever it is, a sponsor. So to me, it just, uh, it, it really, that's how I kind of convinced myself and got over the hump is that I knew, I knew there was a lot I would learn along the way and that it would be, it'd be, you know, win or lose. It, I couldn't see really any downside in participating. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great advice. Uh, again, so you're in on that deal. Do you have any aspirations to be a lead? Have you actually gone out and, and had to raise capital in a, in a GPLP type type uh, syndication raise or just? I have, have you, okay. I, I, I haven't done that personally. I, I think I have aspirations to do that. For me to date, uh, I haven't gotten to the point where I, it's one of those things where if you, if you look at any kind of typical raise, I mean, who's your privately primary participants, it's friends and family to start. Right. And then probably clients and colleagues and whoever else. And, and to a degree, I want to make sure I'm the bona fide expert before I start going there. And I, I, I think I know enough that I'm, I'm first enough that I could probably go do it. But part of it is also too, I mean, my brokerage business is, is so busy as it is right now. And it's, it's going well. I have, you know, some of my alternative investments on the side. I've, I've got enough cooking at the moment that pivoting to being a GP or a lead syndic, you know, a lead on the syndication is it just, it's just not within my realm at the moment. I got two little kids at home too. So that, that takes a hell of a lot of time. So it for me, it's, for me, it's more, uh, it's just time allocation of resources. Right. But I think as my, career progresses on and I probably get my, my thought here is probably in the next three to four years if I'm just looking ahead to that's probably when I'll get to that point where I'll probably be able to spend more of my time doing that kind of work versus just street brokerage side investing what I'm doing now more or less. I, I, I may have asked you this ahead of time um, but have you ever had partners or had had clients who have said hey you want know, to contribute your commission to this deal come into the deal and, and partner? And Absolutely. Have you done that before? And has it how's it worked? Yeah, I've done that in a couple minor instances. Nothing really like formal. I'm actually working on one right now where we're getting ready to close on the property. It's a pretty sizable deal, like a six and a half million dollar purchase. And and the the and I brought the deal uh, along with a, a partner broker of mine to this buyer, and they they indicated day one, hey, if you guys want to participate in the deal at whatever level, rolling half your commission, your whole commission, or commission plus by all means, bring it in. And so I haven't actually made a full decision on if I want to do that one. I got to, I, we're, we're still closing on the property. I got to dig in a little bit more on, on the numbers and everything like that. But yeah, I mean, that that's, can you think of an easier way to put some money into the deal of just since you're, you're already working on it. Yes. You were expecting to collect a commission, but instead of collecting your commission, just roll it right into the investment. I mean, even if it makes you a 2% or 3% or whatever, a very minority owner, you have skin in the game. You're going to learn along the way. And if you believe in the deal, which you, you sold it to that person probably anyway, I mean, chances are the returns and the thresholds are going to get met. So you, you stand to probably do pretty well. Yeah. That's, my thought. yeah. That's kind of why I was asking. I had um, it, the interview hasn't come out yet, but AJ Clink is on. Um, and, and man, he's so I was asking him like what he was doing and, and what his advice was for agents to to uh, either win more deals. Because as brokers, you have you have at least in the, the uh, multifamily space, the inventory is really controlled by brokers, right? And so I imagine you, same in, in industrial, like you guys are seeing more deals than anyone off the street. So his advice was, look, if you want to go and find a deal, you want to get more line of sight on more deals from brokers, you know, offer them something, right? Like what, what can you offer them? Um, and so I just didn't know if people were offering that to you and if it was enticing you to... Um, you know, bring them off market deals or um, uh, anything along those lines. Um, so if, do you have any advice for people like me or operators who are going out buying things um, to winning more deals? I, I think you, you nailed it is letting brokers know that upfront because you're completely spot on. Brokers usually control the market. They pick if it's especially if it's an attractive deal. I mean, if it's a tough deal, that's another story. But if it's an attractive deal, chances are they have choices of who they want to go bring that deal to, right? And depending on your relationship and what you know about the broker's goals, right? They might not be a broker who's interested in investing, but if they are, letting them know as you're building the relationship with them that, hey, by the way, if you ever want to roll some money into the deal, it's something that I'm open to discussing with you. I'd love to have you as part of it. I mean, if you think about it from the operator standpoint too, the broker who sold you the deal probably is pretty knowledgeable and probably actually adds value to the ownership as well. So it's really, a, it's probably a win-win anyway. But also as from just going back to the broker side, don't be afraid to ask for it, right? Because a lot of people might not offer it up front. But if you're shopping a deal and taking its multiple buyers or, or you're starting with one saying, hey, what's important to me is I'd really like to roll some money into this deal. Then by all means, I mean, be open to that as the buyer or the syndicator, whatever you're doing from your end, because I think it does 
add a lot of value. You're going to see more deals, no doubt. And guess what? If it goes, especially if it goes well, then that broker is going to be super amped to bring you the next deal and do it again all over. So the cycle rinses and repeats. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, we're, we're getting to the end here, but I want to touch back on uh, syndications and kind of like the return profiles on industrial deals. Um, and I know there's probably going to be a difference between uh, the different types, the iOS and the warehouse type thing. But when, when, uh, when I'm looking at like a multifamily um, or a syndication or a fund, like we're putting a fund together right now, and uh, like the deal terms that we're offering, it, it it's pretty standard. Um, so I don't know if it's similar in industrial or like the syndication that you invested in. If you recall, like what were uh, like pref uh, splits carry? What was? Do you have that information that that you remember? You know, I don't. I, I don't. Um... You know, I think the the projected IRRs were were well into the teens, which to me felt pretty good. I think the sponsor promote was coming after. Gosh, there was there was like a a sponsor promote and then like a home run promote, and the sponsor promote was something after like twenty percent and a home run after forty, and uh, and typically like an eighty twenty split or like a seventy thirty split, okay. something like that. I mean, it all uh, off top of mind, it, it it all made sense. I mean. I think today, one thing that I've started to see because raising capital has become so much harder, especially going to get debt from the banks, is sponsors are getting more aggressive on their terms that they're offering to people willing to put up some money. I was looking at one actually, an apartment syndication literally just last week. And the the deck that I got had a sponsor promote and a home run promote in it. And then when I had a conversation with the GP running it, he said, hey, actually, we're, we're removing the home run promote. We're just going to you know, get that back to to the investors. I mean, so there's there's your point right there. I mean, they built this with that in mind, and then they're going, we got to get money for this deal, so yeah. let's make it more juicy for the investors. And so, anyway, yeah. Do you do you remember? Like, this is very on point. Like, what was the what was the pref and like what? Because I'm always curious, like what you're seeing in the market, and I'm asking everybody, like, what are you are you seeing? Uh, you know, a new somebody out there offering some crazy eleven pref. You know, like, is it is it are people desperate like that or like what what is <laughs> what's yeah. happening yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't call it desperate by any means so i'm, I'm actually pulling it up as we're talking here so okay. so the targeted returns on this one it was a 10 percent cash yield within one to two years 15 to 18 percent irr two to two and a half multiple um fun life four to six years eight percent preferred so for the sponsor promote eight percent preferred return 25% promote with ketchup and clawback home run promote a 40% above 15% IRR. So that, that home run promote was the one that got removed. And so, um, I, I looked at this indication. I think it's a great syndication actually. Um, I mean, it depends on what your investment goals and your thresholds are. I, I, I really liked it. I'm, I'm at a point right now, kind of like what I mentioned before, where I'm not probably looking for a syndication to put my money into. I'm, I'm, I think the market's going to produce some pretty attractive one-off deals. So that's kind of what I'm holding out my cash for at the moment. But again, not everyone has access to the deal flow that I have, right? I mean, especially if you're like a, you know, think if you're a doctor or some kind of uh, like a stockbroker guy, right? I mean, you, you probably have a, a decent amount of cash or good income to support investing, but you don't, you don't know how to go find a deal. So put your money into a syndication, make sure you like the returns. I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. Yep. That is very true on all points, man. It's awesome. Um, there was something else you just said and I wanted to touch on it before we jumped off. Um, damn it. I forgot now. That was good. I mean, man, it was solid. The information uh, is very helpful. Um, for me, I always like learning about the other asset classes and kind of what's, what's happening and what you're seeing in the market. Um, the return profiles, the, the setups, the syndication, those sort of things. Yeah, it was something to do with that syndication, but uh, April. I'll, I'll, hold on, let me see. Uh, the, the clawback, maybe that's what it was. So there's a clawback, but the home run, oh, that's what it was. So the home run was over 40% IRR and a 10% cash on cash is in a two-year period. I'm like, this is, that doesn't make sense to me. Right well, now in this market, I don't know what market they're buying in, but. It's apartments in Seattle. Um, new construction? No, existing, like okay. probably class, class B value add. Yeah. So 8% preferred return, 25% promote with ketchup and clawback home run promote a 40% above 15% IRR. Okay. 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 But like so I said, the, the they, they, they took that. Jumps. Yes. Yeah. I got it. Okay. 
but they were they were basically saying it's a, they're going to take off the 40 percent above 15 and just keep it at 25 okay. at, you know, that, that makes a lot more sense because i was like if they're saying 40 percent above or, or anything above 40 percent irr that's when they get their home run deal yeah i was like 40, 40 they're not IRR doing sounds... much by taking that off <laughs> yeah like, yeah right oh man generous of them to take that away um yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, that's very, very cool. Thanks for sharing that information because again, yeah. um, if you're listening, like we're, we're just sitting here talking about an offering that is very standard when you are getting into this world and you're looking at a bunch of different deals and syndications or funds or whatever. I mean, these are the terms that you're looking at and the things every, generally a lot of the, a lot of the terms in a PPM kind of are, are kind of the same. It's like, here are the risks, here are the things that we can, uh, uh, like bad boy carve outs, all these things are in there, but then you start looking at the actual, um, the, the returns. And those are some of the things that, that you can mess with, obviously the asset class and, and the, and the investment thesis in general. Sure. But that's why I'm always curious, like, what, what are you saying? So, uh, yeah. that helps me out and, and I appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. Matt, man, it's good jumping on. Um, uh, if people want to reach out to you and they're in your market or or elsewhere, um, all your contact information is in the show notes. So guys, please reach out, um, have a chat, and and he can help you with all your industrial needs. So um, good catching up, man. We'll, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Randall. It was awesome to, to chat with you. And, and uh, you guys have a great listening base. I've listened to all your episodes. I mean, it's uh, what you're doing here is great, so keep it up. Awesome. Appreciate it. All right, man. Take care. You too. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.